Welcome to Think Tech Tech Talks on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we're going to talk about Hawaii as a magnet for institutional hacks. Our guest for the show is Attila Sares of SIPAC. We're going to talk about institutional hacks that are attacking uh, institutions in Hawaii, including, my goodness gracious, the bus. How could they do that to us? Welcome to the show, Attila. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me, Jay. Always glad to help. I saw your uh, piece on the other media about the bus, and I was really, I was, I was shocked that, that anybody would come and attack our bus. Our bus is so close to our hearts. Why in the world would anybody do that? They've got to be malicious, no? You're absolutely right, Jay. And uh, it's an unfortunate, but uh, this is not the first time, and we're not the first place. Uh, these kind of hacks happen uh, on the mainland for a lottery. It happens in other bus and public transportation uh, outfits. So we're just the latest in a long string of attacks. But unfortunately, we are also the gateway to the east, which makes us especially uh, a target because any sort of disruption that the bad guys can do uh, to our critical infrastructure means that we can be less uh, potentially mission ready. So if there was a some sort of conflict that occurred in another part of the world that where we would need to go and assist, uh, if there were problems happening back over here in Hawaii, it might interfere with our ability uh, to be as responsive as we should be. So uh, this is why, uh, you know, we are a target uh, because we are, you know, essentially like the, uh, the ambulance to the east, I guess is a good way to put it. We want to make sure that we are available. And uh, if there's anything that they can do to make us less available, they're going to do it. And uh, when it comes to public transportation, there's money involved. Uh, so they can easily hold these kind of systems for ransom, which is uh, evidently what they did. And uh, like I said, not the first time. The uh, the hack occurred back in 2021. That was the last time that this occurred. Happened again. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the big question is, uh, have they learned their lesson? Is this going to happen a third time? I don't know. What do you think, Jay? So the bus, I mean, you take a ride on a bus sometime. This is not really a, as much a bus community as a car community. So it seems like their targeting is a little bit off. You know, people people ride the bus to go to their jobs. It's uh, you, you wouldn't find the CEO on the bus. You'd find staffers on the bus. And, and so knocking off the ability of the staffers to get to work or wherever they're going just doesn't seem to be a, a, a high leverage kind of activity. Uh, why, why do you feel that they feel they're going to uh, undermine our economy by knocking off the bus. Well, Jay, we're all interdependent. Uh, you know, m many of the folks that ride the bus are disabled veterans. Uh, we have uh, others that, uh, yes, maybe they're in uh, maybe they're in jobs where they're they're not a CEO. But I, I do know some CEOs and presidents ride the bus, and I've ridden the bus. It's it's not uh, it's not something that to be ashamed of, and uh, and it's certainly a valid way to get around. Uh, especially on an island, uh, you know, public transportation is more important than ever. Uh, but like I said, it's anything they can do to disrupt. And you have to well, remember these guys. Is... Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and if they can disrupt, they can charge some money. And if they can charge some money, that's what they're really after. Yeah, look, let's look at that as the as their true mission. They want money. Who are they? Who are they and, and how much money can they get? And what's the business model for doing this? Um, it, it all seems, you know, terribly sinister that they would attack, um, you know, part of the community that really uh, isn't, you know, it isn't the kind of part of the community you want to attack, but they're actually attacking city government. And they figure that city government has some money. Um, so how do they do that? How did they do it now on two occasions? Um, how did they actually stop the bus? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. To you know, we can look at this as a case study uh, for how perhaps our viewers uh, can apply uh, this attack method uh, to their own business, right? To understand where their vulnerabilities might be. Uh, so in the uh, in the bad actor space, uh, there are something called access brokers, and access brokers are uh, bad guys with a specific skill set, and that skill set is gaining access into a network, right? So they, they find a way in, whether through social engineering or they go on uh, public-facing databases such as Shodan to see if there are any uh, ports that are 
perhaps open uh, with uh, equipment that is perhaps unpatched. And then they look for that kind of vulnerability and they find a way inside. And after that point, they say, look, my job is done. I'm ready to sell this access to someone else. And then at that point, mm -hmm, they hand that off. So they sell access to a network. uh, And, and, you know, this this is uh, obviously there's uh, this isn't like a set in stone rule. There are some groups that do both. But the handoff typically occurs at this point. And at that point, the bad guys, a different set of bad guys can come in and say, oh, let's see what's inside of this network now that we have access to it. Do we want to exfiltrate data? Meaning, do we want to get inside of uh, uh, file servers or database servers or exchange servers? That's a big thing that's happening now is exchange uh, data exfiltration. Uh, but uh, that kind of activity then occurs uh, where they you know, decide that they're going to uh, do something bad within the network. And then usually once that's all been completed, they've disabled the backups, they've taken all the data that they can and uploaded it to another place. At that point, they say, well, you know, there's nothing else really for us to do here other than encrypt the entire network. So let's just put everything up for ransomware. And they start encrypting at, at a very inconvenient time. So at the bus in particular, it was like a Friday afternoon. Worst time, right? And uh, so they, they encrypt the network and they say, hey, if you want to have this network restored or uh, get uh, keys that will allow you to decrypt the data, then you have to pay us in cryptocurrency, right? And uh, so that's their little money-making scheme. And unfortunately, what happens at this point, as you can kind of tell by this uh, attack timeline, the ransomware is the very last thing that occurs uh, during this chain of attacks, right? So, uh, you know, they they can very easily then go back and say, look, uh, if you don't pay us, we're going to release this data to the public. And if that's uh, healthcare uh, information, uh, such as what happened recently in the news, there's been numerous uh, healthcare uh, companies that's had their... PII, or I'm sorry, PHA, uh, PHI, <laughs> health information, right? Private health information sold out on the dark web because they refused to pay the ransom, right? So they will then take that data and then sell it out. And that they do that sometimes even if you pay the ransom and say, hey, I want all my data back, don't release it to the public. They sometimes do it anyway. Or they can come back six months later and say, you know what? We still have that data. Pay up again. Otherwise, we'll release it. That's really downright mean. Um, but I guess these guys are mean. I wanted to ask you about them. But one thing you know, I learned from what you said a minute ago is that by the time they get to ransomware, they've already taken your data. They've already got it. And so the ransomware is, is only uh, you know, icing on the cake for them. Make a few bucks in addition to holding, holding the data. That's really disgusting. So <clears throat> one more question before we go to the identity of the individuals involved is what kind of data would a bus company have that would be of interest to them to to take? What what kind of data is there? The people who ride the bus, is that sensitive? Um, What is is the big threat there? That's a good question, Jay. I I don't think that it's the individual rider's information that uh, that they would consider valuable. But if you do work for that organization, and uh, you know you have payroll data, uh, you have perhaps some bank accounts, social security numbers, maybe even a medical history. Um, you know somewhere in a database, someplace inside of that network, or accessible through a computer. There, uh, that would be some valuable data. I mean, uh, so uh, the employees are the ones that are at risk in, in this circumstance. Yeah, and management, everybody in the headquarters, everybody running the company, rather than the individual customers. Other situations like the healthcare business, it's the individual, the clientele, the patients, what have you, and it's their data that would be sensitive. But let's go to who's doing this. You know, I, I, I guess I have trouble imagining, envisioning local people doing a scam like this on a local institution. Um, it's not impossible, but I would guess that the people who do this, and for a buck, and for you know, selling the access and um, selling the data and trying to, you know, rip them off from ransomware. Um, Those people are far away from Hawaii. Am I right? Yeah, you're you're correct. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, these guys are are kind of far off. Uh, The, uh, I believe they're in Vietnam. And uh, the guys who, who took credit for it, they had already previously hacked, like I said, like the lottery and a few other, like, 
municipalities across the U.S. Um, they're they're in it for the money in this case. Uh, however, uh, some of the more recent advisories that are coming out of uh, out of the FBI are for APT forty. Uh, they're part of the PRC, so People's Republic of China. Uh, they're uh, interested more in espionage, uh, stealing trade secrets. Uh, they're using these same methods to go ahead and, uh, of course, extort uh, money from others, but uh, again, disrupt critical infrastructure, right? Uh, you have to remember that perhaps uh, the bus network could be tied into a different network uh, that would be considered more critical, right? Like perhaps, um, you know, gas pipeline or some other energy delivery system or something that would be related or a contractor that could be related to the bus. Mm -hmm. You have to remember this big target attack from a few years ago where they jumped inside of uh, Target's infrastructure, stole all this customer data and credit card numbers and all that stuff. That all happened because a subcontractor who was their HVAC vendor installed a smart thermostat. And that smart thermostat was vulnerable. It was connected to the same network as everything else. And as soon as they moved laterally, I mean, they hopped over to that other side of the network, they're able to see all that customer data, steal it, and uh, you got another breach. So uh, just remember that it's not always the front door that it gets in, it's the side door or the back door. How much of it is when they get somebody on the phone and they manage to wangle his password out um, out of him, and uh, from there they, you know, they can get on the system? And how much of it is the technological you know, invasion um, on on the internet where nobody knows what's nobody is involved in the transaction no human being is involved it's just them getting into your getting into your computer how much of it is one and how much is the other yeah there's uh there's two things that you're talking about here but they all kind of fall under the umbrella of social engineering and mm -hmm. uh you know we used to get those uh, Nigerian uh, scam emails and you know many people would laugh at it but those same guys have evolved over the years and they're no longer uh, you know uh, trying to ask for money uh, pretending to be a prince they are now pretending to be long lost friends or uh, family members or uh, you know they have other scams where they're trying to get uh, folks involved with romance with um, investment scams investment scam is a big one and these are all like individual scans where the dollar amount may sound like it's not that much, like maybe, you know, $500 or $1,500, but you do that at scale and they're bringing in millions of dollars uh, into their local economies uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so social engineering and, you know, everyone's talking about the buzzword of AI. Well, you know, I don't know about you, Jay, but, Sometimes my emails don't seem all that all that good, and you know I I give it to to ChatGPT and I say, hey, can you write this better than I can? And and it does, right? And uh, guess what? The bad guys are doing the same thing. If they're trying to extort money from someone, they can feed that to an LLM, and it can write it better than they could before. That broken English and the punctuation and the capitalization, all that gets fixed. And so uh, the bad guys are doing the same thing that we are. Uh, you know, we're using these uh, new tools to make ourselves better. You still have to use your head when you get messages like that, AI or not, smooth or not. Um, and I, you know, okay. I mean, that you, you have to be very careful. And we get so much email and message traffic these days. You have to be careful about every single one. But what about, you know, the back end? What about coming in through a, uh, through a port, you know, uh, coming, coming through a security system um, that, you know, wasn't closed for some reason, and you don't know, and nobody in your company knows because you didn't have a professional come uh, like you uh, come down and look at it and, and try to find the hole. Um, how much of it is in that? You know, that's an interesting question. So remember I mentioned APT40 from PRC? So APT40 is from People's Republic of China. That's exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for unpatched vulnerabilities, exposed ports on the, on the internet. And this happens a lot on critical infrastructure devices. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, there's plenty of ICS, so industrial control system devices uh, that are connected directly to the internet on insecure ports with passwords that are default from the factory. So there are devices that are open to the internet, right? And these are industrial control devices. ICS devices are uh, by nature industrial, right? Which uh, you think of pipes and electrical grids and that kind of thing. 
Many of these devices are connected directly to the internet with the default username and password that the manufacturer put in them, such as admin and password and admin and 1234 and that kind of thing. Folks can just log into them if they find them on the internet and turn things off, turn things on. Uh, just personally, we've found some schools out here that have their uh, HVAC systems connected directly to the internet so they can change the temperature in classrooms remotely. Well, guess what? Anyone else can too. Uh, we've seen some, uh, you know, if you go on Showdown, there's lots of uh, local companies, everything from supermarkets to tourism to uh, the bus that have certain ports open to the internet. And if they're running services on systems with known vulnerabilities, there's a good chance that someone can get in there and start tampering with things. So basic cyber hygiene, don't have anything exposed to the internet, you don't want to have tampered with. Right, because you don't know where it goes and where they can get to if they get in through through a port. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of times here today, uh, Attila, that there were lotteries going on with this data, with the access. How does that work? And uh, does, does the fact that they put it up for lottery expose them to being caught? The uh, access brokers are are part of the, you know, they're part of the ecosystem. And this really is an industry. It is an ecosystem. There isn't something that, there isn't something that, you know, it's a complete standalone industry. It's all interconnected. So these access brokers, is a specialized skill. And uh, a lot of it is, you know, looking at public information, such as, you know, from the front end, you would look at Shodan, but you could also look on LinkedIn Right. And these access brokers may look for ways that they can impersonate someone uh, and then fool a, the company into wiring some money to uh, to a malicious actor. Uh, we've seen that as well. Uh, there's business email compromise. And that happens a lot of times because a company will think that maybe they're too small or too insignificant uh, to have money stolen from them. And, uh, you know, they're loose, loosey goosey with their passwords. They reuse the same password over and over again. Perhaps they use the password for their email as a shopping site, but then that shopping site gets compromised. That password ends up out on the internet. And then what? Someone can guess their password and get inside of their email and start impersonating the boss uh, and uh, get some money wired out, you know, perhaps to a business, you know, $10,000 isn't, isn't the end of the world, but it's a lot of money. Right. And, uh, and it's especially a lot of money to someone in a third world country and they have, networks of money mules and methods to get that money out of the country very quickly within a matter of hours sometimes. And uh, once that money's gone, it's gone. I saw a movie on Netflix that, that had a kind of boiler room operation with a fairly large room, looked like a business, um, with all these computers and all these guys trying to do, you know, scamming and hacking. And there was a fellow who walked around and uh, encouraged them and taught them and motivated them and so forth. And, uh, and they raised an enormous amount of money. But it was what struck me, and I wanted to ask you about this. What struck me is that it was a physical room in an office building, just the movies now, you know, just the movies, where all of these people were sitting together in the same room, um, a computer classroom kind of affair, um, and doing it together with the uh, leadership around them. Is this the way it goes? Or is it, is it more like um, you got one guy in one country, one guy in another country, and they never meet? A little bit of both. Uh, you know, it's, there's certainly uh, amongst these, they're going to do whatever it takes to win. And uh, there are some folks that get together and, um, you know, they have game plans. For example, I've seen uh, images taken from inside of romance scam uh, call centers, where on the wall they have an attack pattern of how to uh, move a victim from the left side of the board to the right side of the board. The left side of the board being bu building that initial trust, what tools to use, and how they know uh, when it's time to move them to the next side of the board and how to keep fooling them and how long it takes to get a romance scam uh, to to be successful. Uh, and that number, by the way, is anywhere from six to 12 months. Uh, per mm -hmm. first hand, we've seen romance scams. I think the smallest we've seen is about uh, $600 and the most about $250,000 uh, stolen from romance scams. Crypto scams are no different. Uh, they use social media. 
Uh, they use uh, fake websites and fake portals where it looks like your money's growing, but it's actually not. It's just being shoveled away inside of a, a scammer's pocket. And uh, these kind of uh, Bitcoin scams uh, keep on keep on coming. Uh, I think the most we've seen on that front is about one and a half million dollars stolen wow. from an individual person. So these are real dollar amounts. So the, it does kind of run a big range, but this doesn't happen uh, by someone being disorganized. It doesn't happen by you know disparate parties not working together. It's a it's a collaborative effort. It's structured. It's funded. It's well understood, and it works. We've been talking about uh, the bus, and we've been talking about individuals and maybe small businesses, but. You know, I had the impression from the, what I looked up in the news is that Hawaii was being victimized at an institutional level. You mentioned healthcare; that's certainly institutional. Um, and I suppose there are other institutions that are under attack. And so it, it seems to me that in terms of dollars, in terms of threat, in terms of disruption, um, the institutions are a better target for them and a, a target of more concern for us. Can you give us some categories of institutions that are being attacked aside from the bus? Well, think about anyone who is in a federal contract. This is very important. So our, our, our government and our state doesn't do everything on its own, right? There's a system of awards and management and that kind of uh, interaction is what we experience here in Hawaii. Um, we have the highest density of uh, federal contractors out here in Hawaii, more than any other state in the country. And that's because there's a huge need out here. That's everything from facilities management to um, handymen to plumbing, electrical, building, contracting, uh, shipyard uh, service, repair, you name it. All that is outsourced, right? Including cybersecurity, by the way. And those kind of contractors have trusted access to facilities, right? And so if you think about it, remember I told you earlier, you don't go through the front door. You don't come bomb Pearl Harbor anymore. You come after the contractors digitally over the internet, find a way to weasel your way into their networks, either through social engineering, through phishing emails that successfully put uh, malicious payloads on the equipment. And then as those contractors do their thing, right? Service those buildings, fix that water problem, fix that electrical problem, fix that engineering problem, that civil problem, right? Service the airport, any of those kind of tasks, the bad guys are riding on their backs the entire time. To keep on, you know, uh, attacking federal contractors because they have some exposure to what, what's going on on the, on, on the war front. But let me, let me ask you this though. Um, it seems to me, you know, we were talking before about uh, the World War III and, it, and the, I think it was Einstein that said World War III would be fought with sticks and stones. Um, but that, you know, that, that was just his view of it, and it was a long time ago. Now I'm coming around to think, and I want to see if you agree with me, is that World War III is, is going to be or is actually being fought on, on the web, on the net, um, with this hacking and scamming, disrupting our civil society. Um, and so it could get, it will get, it is getting more intense, more threatening right now. I'm sure you'll say that because I think that's true. Um, and, and it could be really dangerous for a given society, for an island, a state, um, a utility company, uh, and a national or international organization. Um, so uh, th that's the future, isn't it? Well, that's that's it. You know, um, many years ago, there was a Star Wars reboot where it was a bunch of robots fighting each other. And, uh, you know, we look at back at that kind of comically. Uh, that's happening now, but it's on the digital front. So you'll see, you know, big maps. You can Google as, you know, real time cyber threat maps. You can see big maps with, uh, you know, attacks going on between different parts of the world. Uh, you know, folks, in, uh, the bad guys can get footholds in computers in any country, anywhere on the globe, and then use it to attack us and and disrupt our infrastructure. And they're successful many of the times. I, I anticipate that 2024 is going to be the worst year to date, just like 2023 was in 2022. The next year is going to be even worse than that. 
kind of like climate change. It's uh, it's changing every year. Yeah. So my my next question is, who's watching the store? Now, if you watch that movie I was talking about, or lots of other movies where we see hackers at work and doing disruptive, dangerous, criminal things, um, we see we see the good guys going after them. We see the <clears throat> the uh, security authorities and the the police and the, the federal intelligence officers going after them. And in a, in a most movies, they they win, you know, because in Hollywood. The good guys usually have to win. But who's watching the store now? Who's preventing, you know, a, a catastrophe, uh, expanding catastrophe in this area? Well, you know, I guess the best analogy I can say is that um, the roads. So if you look at the roads all throughout our fine state, many of them are in poor shape. It's just a fact. But there's some other ones that are really great shape. The ones that are in really great shape are the ones where the most cars drive. So with a fixed amount of ink, uh, of money to spend to fix roads, they're probably going to put it towards the ones where most of the cars are driving. And then on the little side streets and such, you're going to have a bumpy experience. Same thing when it comes to cyber and when it comes to what the feds can do to slow it down. They're going to go after the big guys best they could uh, or best they can and, uh, you know, the big networks of, uh, of criminals and the kind of commoditized criminal market. Uh, but they're not going to be able to go after everyone, and especially the, um, you know, poor old grandma who's getting romance scammed or, uh, you know, someone else is getting crypto scammed. They're, you know, if they're losing just a few thousand dollars here or there, uh, there's not much they're going to be able to do. So it's going to be an individual initiative. You as a person are going to have to be more vigilant more skeptical and stop and think before you jump uh, to what the bad guy is telling you to do. You talked about AI is my last question. Hopefully there is in here somewhere, there's new technologies that can beat these guys because, you know, in the existing technology, at least in my perception, uh, we're, we're losing this battle. They're getting more effective at what they do. Uh, they're making more money. They're more threatening. They're more threatening on, on the individual level, on the corporate level, and on the national level, government level. Um, so, you know, where does this end? We, we need to have somebody come up with something. Uh, maybe you know, you know, agencies that are working on this um, that will identify them and enable prosecution. Because right now, you never, ever see anything in the newspaper or in the media that says, we just got him. We caught him. We're going to let them have it now it, that we never hear that. And so, you know, the, the general perception, my perception is that they get away with it increasingly. And that makes it attractive to new recruits, doesn't it? Well, there are big takedowns that do occur uh, so that that does happen. Uh, like you said, though, it's, it is few and far between. And oftentimes the, uh, you know, the, the syndicate will just recover and, and reorganize and get back up and going. Like Lockbit was a perfect example. It was a coordinated effort, went across the globe, shut down many of the critical servers, made some arrests, um, international effort. But at the end of it, they're back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I can only say so much. And, and in my opinion, it's up to each of us individually to be defensive about uh, our individual responsibility in keeping ourselves safe. Um, we can only do so much to rely on on the feds. Uh, so, and they rely on folks like us to go out and spread the word and say, "Hey, be careful, think twice, let's use some common sense, uh, don't get fooled." And uh, you know, if there is a problem, you know who to call. Yeah, take it seriously. So I know you know SIPAC is a it's a corporation, it's a business. And you, you know, you want to stay in business and do the things you need to do to stay in business. At the same time, you're, you know, you're, you're making a contribution to the community at large, to the society at large. And I want you to know that uh, we appreciate SIPAC and similar organizations out there because in many ways you are the front lines and we want you to succeed in, in preventing and stopping these guys. You know, it's it's true. Uh, you know, we are a company, and it's not a negative thing. Uh, you know, 
the the funds that you know companies pay us to continue to be here allow us to continue to be here and provide some defensiveness so we do our best and we try to do all we can to help everyone uh with this really bad problem thank you attila attila sares sipac here in honolulu protecting us finding new ways to protect us our society our businesses and our individual our individual life fortune and sacred honor thank you so much attila Thank you.